just buy a whole new computer because it won't run on Windows 8. Windows 8 is just like a big tablet software. It's hokey. Hmm. I like Windows 7. Yeah, yeah I do too. I guess you can force Windows 8 to Windows look 7. like Windows 7. That's what I do. I have when I had to buy Windows 8. <coughs> the camera's up. <coughs> Smile, Dan, you're on the camera. Okay, the camera. I thought he said it wasn't working yet. I saw it come on. Oh. Yep, the webcam. Oh, it's not. Okay. So. So it's the sound that's messing up? Yeah. You should have rebooted this too while you were at it. No, we don't want that. Yeti. I thought you waved at me, so I waved back. Okay, let's see where we are. Hit it. <clears throat> okay, we're switching to the Yeti permanently for the rest of this podcast until I figure out what is going on. So, anyway... Okay. Okay. Welcome back for the third time. Hopefully, <laughs> had a cup of <laughs> hopefully, we've had to switch to just our standard Yeti microphone, and uh, hopefully, we'll just go with it the rest of the podcast. Um, I can move this stuff out of the way and turn this off. We're all good there. Um, what was we talking about? Tithing. 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 Our, good old, our good old Twitter question, yeah, was asked about what our thoughts are on tithing. And Dan, I'm sorry, right in the middle of your wonderful exposition on tithing, uh, we died. So if you could recap for our listeners uh, what what your thoughts are, and we'll go kind of around the room and get thoughts on tithing. Well, um, you, you ended up on... Uh, Abraham and Melchizedek. You was starting right. to talk about we do, that. Should I read this part about read, the Read 1 Corinthians church. 16 again. 1 Corinthians 16 says, Now to the collection of the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. When I arrive, whoever you may approve, well, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem, and if it's fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. So that is usually used to show the New Testament tithe, yeah. right? So, but if you really look at it carefully, he's not talking about, he's talking about a, a gift to another church, to yeah. the Jerusalem, Jerusalem. church, yeah. who is in a state of uh, famine and financial situation. Yeah. He said to Yeti. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you were not using the, these mics anymore. Oh, okay. okay. So you can move them so, out of the way. But, you know, the principle, what I was saying is the principle is still good for us. You know, that, that we should make an effort to right. give oh, and, yeah. and as the Lord prospers us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, it, when Jesus came along, he raised the bar. Absolutely. You know, he, he didn't lower the... the, the uh, the standard or whatever Christian life is supposed to be about. Yep. He made it even closer. Not in a bad way. I'm not saying that heavy-handed bad way. I'm just saying, he's saying, look, you have God within you now. You, you don't have to just do the minimal, uh, you know, good duties of a Boy Scout or whatever to get your little star. You know, you have, you have God within you. You have the divine nature in you. And you was, should willingly want to be generous and helpful and loving in every way you can. He was one to compare, he's really comparing a lot to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what they did in their tithing, that it was right. just an outward show. Right, you know? yep. right. But, but here's my question is, we don't have the Levitical system. We don't have a tribe of people that, that can't do any, that have to take care of a tabernacle and all right. that. We do have full-time Leaders, pastors, teachers. Actually, we even have uh, secretaries, workers, janitors, all sorts of people yeah. that are full time that don't have jobs uh, that they could make a financial profit on. So they're just serving the Lord like that. 
So we could carry that over and say, you know, uh, we're in a similar, similar situation. But on the other hand, their, the early church didn't have any of those things. They just had people and families and they just opened up their homes and they got together and they prayed and they, you know, but the early church, people sold whole houses and gave to the church. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. There's that high standard again. You know, it was a willing thing. Ananias and Sapphira said, he said, look, that was your land. That was your money after you sold the land. What my problem is, you're lying about it. You know, mm-hmm. hypocrisy. It's fire, you know, same old thing. But uh, the, the idea, I think that, I wonder if people are thinking, boy, if I don't have to tithe, won't that be great? You know, I mean, they're thinking, if they're thinking that way, they're missing something. On the other hand, if you grind it, put it over your head, and tell, and I think, to me, saying people, you're robbing God and all that, to try to drag the money out of Malachi the congregation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're robbing God and everything. And uh, I don't agree. I don't, I'm not happy about that either. I, I think that the, the, yeah. the, the churches should have enough faith to know that God can, can you know, teach the giving, teach the generosity, teach that God, everything you have belongs to God, good stewardship belongs to you. And uh, the, ten, the, the 10% is, a gu- is just a general guide. I mean, all of what we have belongs to God. And he lets us give back that just as a more or less a token or, or an expression of how much we appreciate him. Yep. And even Jesus was the tithe. Well, you Absolutely. can spiritualize everything and say, well, Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfills the tithe. He was the tithe, the first fruit under God, right? Sure. Well, we could spiritualize it and do away with everything if we, if we decided yeah. to go that way. Mm-hmm. And I think, again, we're missing the point. Paul never said anything well, like it's that. Well, yeah, it's about, ultimately, it's about the heart. That's exactly That's right. That's exactly where Jesus nailed it. He said, where your treasure is is where your heart is. And mm-hmm. people's heart is tied. And I don't say everybody, but as a rule, people's hearts are tied to their finances. Yes. Because they work hard and they sweat and they labor and they work hard for that money, you know. Right. And it's 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 very important to them. And they, you know, uh, um, you, your heart is tied. You know, what what was the one guy that said? He brought up tithing. It was one of the scriptures I was looking up. Uh, he said, "I fast twice a week. Mm-hmm, I give tithes mm-hmm, of all mm-hmm. that I possess. Mm-hmm. What you know? What else is there left for me to do?" Luke eighteen, you know, mm-hmm. kind of a deal. Uh, people. It's got to be a heart thing. People give. I, I have seen it over and over and over and over where at Emmanuel specifically, I'll just use because that's the church I'm the most familiar with, where we've had 20 adults in a service and a missionary come through and it touches those people's hearts. And it touches those people's hearts. And they just write a check and raise $1,000 with 20 people in the room, you know, kind of a deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's tied, it's tied to the heart, you know. Uh, I don't think we should law over anybody about tithing and offering and those kind of things. Um, I do know this, though, and I say this a lot at Emmanuel, is that from my perspective, it's never less in the New Covenant. God would never, the New Covenant is always a much more, a much better. So, to me, it shouldn't ever be, your giving in general shouldn't ever be below what was under an old covenant and old order, you know. Uh, it shouldn't ever be that dirt, that way. Uh, but that's just that's just my perspective. I don't know, Harold, Bob, what are you guys' thoughts about the tithe and the offering? Um, I want to go back to a comment Dan made. He said, we can spiritualize and say, Jesus is the tithe, but there's a substance in there that we don't want to spiritualize because there's a connection that's made. I did three weeks on giving and I never got to this part. The Lord just told me to drop it. So I just dropped it. I didn't push it anymore. But the last, one of the last segments is about Jesus being the tithe, but how we, even with Abraham and what he connected to. I'm, I'm, I'm of a persuasion of that we're not under some legal, you know, some kind of mandated level of giving, but 
if we understand the principle of giving from Jesus' perspective, and I'm actually quoting the book of Acts where Paul quotes Jesus and says, it's more blessed to give yeah, than yeah, receive. Yeah. That is a lifestyle of giving. We live to give and we give to yeah. We don't give to live. Living is giving and giving is living. If you're really going to live this life, then you're going to look at ways of giving constantly. Mm -hmm. And you're going to seek the Lord for ways to give constantly of all things. Just like you quoted the guy in Luke 18. And there, there, are, there are certain things that are in New Covenant logos that's written in the letters. <clears throat> and Paul said they that preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Yeah. But it, it's, it's not one of these things where, and I know this scripture is, is used a lot, as long as the earth remains their seed time and harvest, giving is not about getting. I can't find it scripturally in the new covenant. So guys, you, if you can straighten me out with that, that's fine. Giving is not about getting in the new covenant. Giving is because we've already received. We've been blessed with everything. Whether we see it or not, God has given right. us all things that pertain to life and godliness in or through Christ Jesus. And so we have nothing left to do but to give as part of our living. But you know, Paul knew that it could become a stumbling block. And he said, just so you can't get confused about this, I'm going to work. He said, I'm, I'm work with my own hands sure. and not ask a thing from you. Just to avoid that problem. He knew that in some places it could become a stumbling block. Oh, my, uh, so, you know, with, yeah. we, and I've known pastors that, that took that point of view. And I, and I think that we need more of that to get this idea out of people said that you were in it for the money. There's so many of them that seem to be in it for the money. <laughs> and, you know, it makes it easier for a person to give to give out of their heart when you know somebody's not being greedy yeah. about it. You know, I think there, there's a two-way street going on there. In the giving, yeah. and I know people that would just as soon give to anybody else but a preacher. Mm -hmm. They're giving people, oh, but yeah. they just hate that concept. That well, that, that brings person, a whole nother. Yeah, my maybe, brother maybe said about that. Somebody <laughs> said when somebody was quoting somebody that I know that said, "Whenever yeah. you see a preacher, hang on to your wallet." You know. Yep. And that uh, that's sad. I mean, and, I, and I and I and I and I I understand that. I understand people's sentiment. There. I totally understand. You know, yeah. and so we really have uh, to get across, but. The funniest thing about it, we all know there's a lot of preaching going on about the law and that the Ten Commandments are obsolete, but I've never heard anybody say that tithing was obsolete. None of those preachers on TV <laughs> that are saying the Ten Commandments are obsolete are I saying that either, tithing man. is obsolete. I haven't either, Dan. That's for sure. You know, and, and so there you go again. You know, I, I, I'm not saying any of it's obsolete. I think all Scripture is for our learning. Yeah. All that's written there is for our learning. Mm -hmm. What can I learn about it? I'm not under a yoke of, of the law or, or the tithing or anything, but I am under Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a servant of Christ, and I want to please Him yeah. with all my heart, mm -hmm. or I should want to please Him with all my heart. Well, I don't know. So, I, yeah, I don't know about you. I don't know about you guys, but I have done this as a vocation uh, for a long time, twenty some years now. And I promise you, you don't get into this for the money. <laughs> as as one who has lived, who's yeah. done ministry for tw and yeah. and probably of the twenty two years I have been in ministry here at Emmanuel, at least nineteen and a half of them I have had some other vocation outside of the yeah. church, you know, I to up, to, uh, to offset my income because you don't go into this for the money. There's only a few that get. The, the problem is, and let's just say it, it's TV. Yeah. TV and the need to pay that big TV dollar yeah. has put a tape on everybody's, you know, everybody who wants to be skeptical about the church and all the good that the church does. They don't see the 99% of ministers. I would go who, further than that. Yeah. You, you know, the, the, the 1%, the 1% that's on... TV that it's 
you know, that you better hold on to your wallet. You know, sell your hundred dollars so you'll get your thousand dollar seed, you know, fruit back, and you know all of that. That stuff. Paul called it dung. Right. You know, that's the reason people have. When when my experience has been, my experience has been that ninety nine point eight percent of the ministers that I have run into. Uh, and I have built relationship. They live month to month. That's right. They give far more than they ever receive. They work seven days a week, twenty four hours a day. They, they they get called away from Thanksgiving meals to go deal with family people in the hospital. They get called away from Christmas mornings and Christmas days with their family to go deal with issues. And that's in all denominations. And that's in every yeah. denomination. Yeah. I'm not talking about. I'm talking yeah. about Methodists, right. Baptists, Lutherans, all all, all of them. Yeah. The, the so any person who says, well, all ministers are about is money, that person is ignorant. And, I, and I'll say it directly to your face. I tell now, them. TV <laughs> preachers may TV. Some of these TV preachers may <laughs> hold on. I'll let you have your minute, Dan. T, <laughs> TV, there are a lot of TV preachers that have given a lot of bad, you know, feelings about ministry as a whole, right? You know, and and a lot, and, and, a lot, and you know, it's a reciprocal cycle. We get a big church, we get a big TV ministry. We got to pay both those bills, you know. But it's not been my experience that most people in ministry do not get into it for the money. Some do. There, I, I, there some do. Yes, they're good absolutely. at it. They can't. But you know, I was telling somebody the other day. I said, for every one, there's a thousand that are not getting anything for their own benefit out of all of this. And I said, I could probably go about three or four square miles just from my house and find a hundred. Pastors, teachers, whatever, yep. that are just serving the church in the best way they know how. Yep. You know, I mean, it'd be interesting to just go and knock on doors and say, are you, are you a pastor and see how they live? You know, and you'd probably be amazed yep. to find out how many small groups and congregations there are all over the city of Columbus. I imagine there's at least a thousand in this city area that... That are At not least. even getting a dime from their churches. Yeah. They're not. They're not getting anything. But they're giving to their churches. Yeah. Let alone being vocational. You know, their yep. church can't afford them to go vocational. Yep. So you know, uh, it's it is it is a shame that the, the world sees the other too much. You know. Sure. Well, I've been doing this for ministry for almost forty years, and I've been bi bi vocational. So I worked a job and did ministry, and you talk about a super tax load. Yeah. Uh, had a family, I raised a family. <clears throat> this is what I don't understand. You know, people say, well, it's too high. I got little kids. I raised little kids. I didn't raise just my kids. I raised my family's kids. <laughs> and half the church's kids probably, you know. Raised them. Yeah. And, and worked a job and sure. did, did the work of the ministry. Yep. And would be called away all the time, all the time, and yeah. didn't even talk about salary. Didn't talk about yeah. getting anything. It was what I could give and put in. We we had a season probably all oh, about year five or six here at the church where literally my wife and I tried for three years in a row to go on vacation, and somebody would die right before we got ready to leave. I mean, three times in a row, you know? And it was like, well, you can't avoid that. You know I mean? You know, you got to stay. And we would end up having to cut our, our vacation time short to accommodate another family. Those are just, that, that's what you just, you sign, that's what you sign up for, you know? You don't sign up for the, the lights and the glamour and Rolex watches and, and jet planes and, I mean, all this junk that you see that goes on, right? There, right? I used to, I used to, like, take our kids camping. And we didn't have cell phones then. But I'd let somebody know where I was, and sure enough. <laughs> somebody show up by the Bible. And leave them, and I'd leave and go do whatever I need to do and then come back and miss it. We never, I've never had a vacation. I don't know about you guys. I have never been have on a vacation. <laughs> okay, you're going to get on one of my pet peeves now. All right. Why is it that there's no one else 
willing to do those things. That are Come on. Uh, the Bible says, equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Yeah. And we have got this separation, class separation, still going on yet today. Absolutely. That 500 years after Martin Luther said the priesthood of all believers, you know, we're still saying that, no, that's your job, you know, when it's everybody's job to jump to the, to the rescue of a family that's, that's important that's had let, me, let me read a scripture because this this, this, is tithing. this this ties right into tithing giving the whole nine yards and, and I'll get you guys this impressions on this at the birth of the church now check this out when the church was birthed I, I've been really interested about the early church so I'm starting to do some research just personal research about the first hundred years or so of the church but Acts chapter 2 44. Now, listen to what it says. It says, Now all who believed were together. That's important. Mm -hmm. that, that phrase alone is very important. And had all things in common. Mm -hmm. Verse 45. And sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So it sounds to me like, and this is how I read that. A lot of ways you can probably interpret that scripture. But this is how I read that. As the church was being birthed, okay, and you see this a lot in missionary work in th third world countries and stuff, it ain't about, not, they don't all have, you know, 40 hour week jobs and it's just easier to write a check. Whatever was needed, they sold those possessions, that they, they made it, they realized truly that this is my family and we stick together and we take care of one another. So if there was a need, you were expected, it was expected the church would, as a body, would give, sell their possessions, whatever they had, to make sure that need was met. But in turn, I, and, and people say, well, that would never work today. Well, yeah, because we, there's no accountability today in any kind of family thing. But that person who was helped, I guarantee you, was expected to become a producer so that they could give to the whole of the body. That's the reality of it, you know? That's, that, to me, is, it's all about, are we going to connect at the, at the heart level? You know, when, when we connect at the heart level, it involves our, I mean, people walk in my house all the time and, and I, and I have to explain to them, well, I have this and I have this TV and this, this, cause this was given to me. This was given to me. This was given to me. I don't go run out and buy all these, you know, toys and, you know, and we give away stuff all the time. Cause that's just how, how I live. I give books away. I give furniture away. I, I, I don't know how many computers I have built and just given away. You know, the, the computer the church has now, I just built it and gave it to the church. You know, that's what it's about. We have all things in common, you know. And so, to me, that's the heart of giving is I'm good at technology. I'm good at computers. I'm good at some of these kind of things. That's where I can give. Somebody else, maybe somebody else is good at electrical work and could fix and change outlets and, and switches and those kind of things. They can give that way beyond just the finances mm -hmm. to make sure that the whole joint, the whole thing supplies one to another. Mm -hmm. what do you, I don't know what your thoughts. What do you guys think? You know, I, I was thinking about this, but um, in my Amplified Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, um, I just like the way the Amplified says this. It says, remember this. Paul was talking here about preparing an offering, I think, for Jerusalem. And he said, remember this, he who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. <coughs> and he who sows generously and that blessings may come to someone will also reap generously and with blessings. Let, a, let each one give as he has made up his own mind and purposed in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. For God loves... That is, he takes pleasure in prizes above other things and is unwilling to abandon or to do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver <laughs> whose heart is in his giving. Reference Proverbs 22 9. Yeah. And God is made able to make all <coughs> grace abound to you yeah. in abundance. And, you know, you may, it's just, to me, it's just not even thinking about the 10%, but just. Just like it says here, giving out of your heart, a willingly, a willing offering. I think that's, I think that's 90% of it is, you know, you're not giving grudgingly or of necessity. But I think people a lot of times, though, just don't think about 
a church building, even a small church building, uh, what it takes to run that building, forget about the pastor, you know, the lights on, the heat's on, the, the air, AC is on, opening the doors, paying insurance. And yet, you know, would they, they would just think, well, someone will just think, uh, not without thinking, uh, hey, can I use your church for this wedding, our wedding yeah, or yeah, a yeah, funeral, yeah. you know? It's like, this is all free. No, it's yeah. not free. <laughs> Somebody has to pay for all this stuff. Yeah. And it's like, no, everybody take, has to take into account that these things are not free. You know, they're not. You know, I want to say one more thing. (laughs) No, say you know, say two more. If you're a member of the Lions Club, you're going to pay dues willingly because you want the you want access to that group and those facilities. Yeah, Yeah, and that's not even a sacrifice. That's something you're actually purchasing that that access. Yeah, but yet, to me, giving to the church to keep the lights going is for you. It's not even given to God. Yeah. If you really want to look at it, <laughs> yeah. it's for you to have a nice, comfortable seat with air conditioning. You can come there. And there are people that live in poor neighborhoods and dunky houses, but they know that they can live like a king when they come to church. And they're happy to give a little bit, you know, or happy to be there, maybe not yeah. to give. But that that's, you know, not against that. I'm saying that's a good thing to have a nice environment. But we're, when we treat it like it's a sacrifice, I think we're fooling ourselves. Yeah. We're, giving, we're coming to sit in a nice you know, event and enjoy it with other people, and why should we consider even a sacrifice helping pay for the, the lights? Amen. Come on, you know, pay for the... Any other social group will gladly pay for whatever it takes to get that facility. Amen. Well, I want to welcome our uh, our live stream viewers. We've had a couple pop on here in the last few minutes since we got started. So just so I can bring you up to date, welcome live stream viewers. We're glad you're here. Please feel free to put questions in the chat uh, for our panel that's here today. This is Kingdom Conversations Podcast, broadcasting on Emmanuel Church TV. And our subject matter, we got a Twitter question that asked us about tithing and giving. And so we've been having a discussion about finances and giving uh, and those things, and so we've been really, I've been really blessed by the conversation. Let me throw something out. I, I, I was talking to a friend a couple years ago who, uh, uh, and we've had a, a couple of the guys here, Bob and Dan, both have owned businesses at one time, and I thought I'd like to get your perspective because I think this guy was thinking more on a larger scale, but you guys have both owned small businesses and been small business owners. He said, what if we radically change the, the viewpoint about giving and supporting the local ministry? He said, what if Christian businesses, we, we promoted kingdom dynamics and we were always encouraging kingdom businesses to grow and to, to prosper and to better themselves and to use those naturally gifted talents to grow and build big, you know, large companies so that they could support people in the kingdom and all that. But he said on top of that, what if those businesses would set aside a tithe portion, a portion of their revenue specifically to support ministry, not buildings, not nothing else, just, just to support ministry? Because and, and I'm thinking about what he's saying. I'm like, okay, what's the ramifications of this? He said, if ministers were not supported by the people in the church, would it change what they say on Sunday morning? In other words, would it free them up to just speak openly and willingly? And it also would put maybe some of the strain off the congregation to feel like they got to support X amount of staff, X amount of... And it was kind of a radical, and he was saying, then you incorporate the ministry right into the business. You you actually, they, they work hand in hand with these, these businesses as they grow to do spiritual counsel, mentoring, that kind of thing bringing kingdom down, uh, uh, leaving the owner to do what he does best, and that's be a CEO and run a company, and, and allowing the ministry to come in and bring spiritual dynamics to encourage the workers, encourage the staff. The, I thought it was a really radical kind of, uh, you know, but what we do now is, is, you know, we encourage people to do businesses so they can just sow directly into the church kind of a deal. And he was saying, what if we bypass the whole church model and encourage networks of uh, of businesses to support networks of ministry in the community. I, I don't know. I thought it was an interesting, and I think he was thinking more 
Because it's hard. I know small businesses is tough. I mean, it's feast or famine with small business. But I'm interested in you guys' thoughts that direction at all, you know. I don't know. You guys are both, Bob and Dan have both been, been small business owners, you know. But just your thoughts. Well, you know, my small business is me. And so when I give, <laughs> it's my small business is giving. So, yeah. yeah. I don't have a board of directors or any other money right. going anywhere else. It's all going to my family. So it's, you know, it's a debt. That's a, I don't really have much experience in that corporate world or whatever, in corporations yeah. and all that. But yeah, if, if, a, if a business would, and I think there probably are businesses like that, that give percentages to charities and churches and things like that. Right. Uh, but, uh, and a lot of them given to politicians too, <laughs> because no, to, to, promote never. Their, to promote their uh, interests. But yeah, I mean that's one. Of, that's the kingdom of God. You know, it's all about influencing. You know, whatever, yeah. whenever. Yeah. I, I think that the idea of going back to the church building is a useful uh, tool. And I said what I said about being, we we're doing it for ourselves, but really we're, there is another side of it. I want to keep that in check that, that by providing a place, not only for ourselves, but for others to come and hear the gospel. Right. We are ministering. Even if you give to the building maintenance, you are giving oh, yeah. to the kingdom. You are yeah. giving to the, the gospel message, you know, besides the, the, the ministry of the people. Uh, but I think the emphasis in the New Testament was more towards sharing with the men and women that were doing the work, so they could do their work, so they could travel and you know. Go it was on. helping churches though too, people in uh, famines. And right, stuff that's like that. he was. Yeah, so, so we just got through seeing there yeah. that he was raising up an offering so they could support the church in Jerusalem. I know in Cincinnati they have a. Uh, ministry called Matthew 25 ministry where these Christian people they just go wherever the need is you know it's like a Christian rig cross kind of thing and where people have been hit by disasters yeah. hurricanes earthquakes or right. uh, uh, you know, floods and stuff like that mostly around here but that's pretty right. pretty good we gave uh, I gave out of the out of, of Second uh, Corinthians, you know, I set aside the first of the week or whatever prospered in the business and then whatever my personal profit. So we actually gave twice. I gave out of my own personal and then we gave out of the business, gave into the ministry. And we did sure. limit it to a tithe. Hmm. I haven't been locked in a tithe for decades, but yeah. just gave as the Lord said and um, <clears throat> uh, and that was in, in just simple uh, heart giving to the Lord um, because of an, a, 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 an experience that I experienced personally yeah. at his request one time he just told me to empty my checking account and it was a missionary yeah and I emptied it out, and I sat and cried like a baby. All of the cheer that my check was soaked with tears. Yep. And I gave it. I wrote the check out, emptied the account, yep. and then the next thing I know, I had too much business. I, my my earliest, and that's the Lord. It's by the heart. My earliest memory as a child. I mean, I couldn't have been five or six years old. I'm telling you, one of the first memories I have as a child was my parents, I remember riding in the little white Chevette, uh, uh, coming home from church over at the house of prayer. I think it was like a Wednesday, it was a midweek service. And mom and dad were talking because house of prayer needed to raise funds to build the addition, to build onto the building there. And I remember them talking and my dad had worked his first real summer of construction. He'd done pizza delivery, worked at the gas station, three and four jobs to make ends meet first good summer. And they had saved like $2,000 in the checking account. And they were going to use that to put a deposit down on a, to build a house. And I remember they went back and forth, you know, should we give that money? We've got that $2,000 sitting in the, you know, 
And I remember then <clears throat> my dad saying, well, you know what? If the Lord provided that, he'll provide more. And I remember as like a five-year-old, them writing a check for two, emptying out their checking account to see that building get built. And, and, and I can tell you by example, I have seen it in my own parents' life, their whole life, abundantly financially blessed. My dad getting promoted everywhere, like Joseph, anywhere he went in business, he just got promoted up the ladder. Yep. And I've seen them write thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of checks to God. And they, they just got it. They got it from the very beginning that it wasn't theirs, it was the Lord's. And the Lord has used them as a funnel to do that, to just sow and to give and to pour out of their lives. And um, you would not believe the abuse they took for that. People would get so mad and jealous of my parents for being blessed, getting promotions, you know. And it's not just about my mom and dad. I, there was a local businessman in the community here in Columbus, very well known years ago, that opened up a Christian uh, a concert house that, that probably everybody here, but maybe Bob, has been to right out here on I-70. They, have, they did concerts. One of the first places to bring in Christian rock bands, music bands and stuff, and do concerts to try to reach teens, young people, that kind of thing. And I remember talking to the owner, the, the, the guy that owned this music hall, he was an electrician, owned an electric company. He was a contractor. He was a contractor. And he told me, he said, I lose $50,000 a year in this music hall bringing these bands in. And I said, how do you afford to do that? And he said, every dollar that I lose here, the Lord adds $2 to my business. He said, I'm making profit at my business. He said, every year that I have done this, I have, I have, made, I have made well and above and beyond to be able to afford to do this. It's a blessing to me and Dan. We saw Phil Keggy twice. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so they would bring in national acts. They'd bring in the big hitters. You yeah, know? They took up offerings out there and you know it, it's a blessing to give because yeah. you got in there free. Free, yeah. never charged That's a dime, great, not whatsoever. And I and I helped receive a lot of those offerings. And I promise you, very rarely did those offerings ever cover the cost. Like you said, electric bill and you know, all of the stuff that goes on. But it's about the condition of the heart. Mm -hmm. yep. It's about man realizing I'm just listen. I'm just a vessel that's here for the Lord, man. Whatever, whatever He wants to do is what He wants to do. So I don't know. That's a long way to answer a Twitter question. But I, I, I want to go back and make a comment. Dan said something that's one of his pet peeves. He said, "Why isn't it a kingdom of priests?" And it is. At that time, when I was in ministry and doing all these things, and and. I was giving wrong counsel to the believers that I had charge of. I didn't understand what I do now. But you know the Lord will, will change your thinking yeah. if oh, you will let good. him. He will bring truth and light to, and his counsel into your understanding. And now I'm very much, I'm probably more engaged in ministry, but I'm in an entirely different posture than I was then. And there's so much vested that he's vested in me as an individual. If I don't receive, if I don't receive and believe the quality of Christ that's in me, then others aren't either. Yeah. And so I want to convey that it's not arrogance; it's confidence. I have a confidence, Godward, and now I agree. Others need to step up. They need to be released. People need to be released in the grace to function and carry out the work of the ministry. Amen. Mm -hmm. It is a body ministry. It's never been anything else. It's not about one guy doing this, that, and the other thing. It's about the body <laughs> moving as a body. And, but yet the posturing is, is totally shifted. And I can see why it has to be. Because there has to be made room for others. Sometimes people didn't feel they had the room. They always thought, that's I right. need to call That's right. Brother Bob. I need to call Dan. I need to call Roger. Right. You know, this yeah. happened, so I got to call. Yeah. And now not realizing that, hey, the one that they're really calling on is in them, and he'll do whatever they can do. Amen. Awesome. Yeah. Any other thoughts this morning? I, I have, I'm actually getting against the time break for me, but uh, other thoughts or anything in that direction? It's good. <laughs> a lot here i mean it seems, we, like, we we just, seems just like we blink and we've kind of gotten going well um 
going to take a break. I don't know if this is the end of the <coughs> podcast. I, I have to actually take off here in a little bit. I had some stuff come up during since we started the podcast, so uh, I may have to scoot out here in a little bit. Maybe the end of the podcast, may not, I don't know. But you're listening to Kingdom Conversations, and maybe we'll be right back after the music. <laughs> well, I get a call from the school. Ben has left his lunch and his no, his backpack at the house. <sighs> so now I so now I've got to shift everything around. I've got to go to the school. Is that a long way from here? Westerville. Mm-hmm. Got to go to school, take his lunch to him in his backpack, and I'll probably end up just staying in town working, which will free me up tomorrow. <laughs> Do you have your revelation last night? Serious? Yeah, it was terrible. Was it? It was just so bad. <laughs> God, I'm just the... that ain't gonna slap you. <laughs> no, it's good. Yeah, what less than forty-seven. To, what was you in last night? Uh, we began he chapter eleven. Mess. Eleven. Chapter eleven. Just introduced in chapter eleven. Okay. He was a mess. He was everywhere. No, he got coming to that. Just me and Bob. <laughs> You, you got somebody coming there. You, were you keeping a big secret? <laughs> we got our regular. No, I don't know. He has to know who's going to be there before he'll go. I don't like know. To, just like this morning, he wasn't going to come until I said I was coming. I I don't know. I'm just hearing. <laughs> I'm hearing.